Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here. My guest today is Melanie Follick. And Melanie is the author of multiple books, including Knitting in America, Kids Knitting, and most recently, um, Making a Life, Working by Hand, Discovering the Life You Are Meant to Live. Welcome to my channel, Melanie. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. And I met you at Walk Knitting and we chatted for a bit. It's very interesting, the whole story of how you created this last book. But I want to, before we go into the book and all the stories that you shared in that book, I want to talk about your personal story. How did you start crafting? Do you remember your first crafting memories? Yes. Um, you know, I, I remember being at home when I was really young and having like a big pad of newsprint and with pencil um, drawing birthday cakes. And I would draw like the icing and the candles. And <laughs> I remember that, it, you know, that I would draw them again and again. <laughs> I guess I liked cake and I liked birthdays. Um, and then I have this vague recollection of, um, and this might've been earlier of like a box showing up with a big easel you know, like a two-sided easel. So my brother and I could use it with like paints and pad and crayons and all of that stuff. Um, so throughout my childhood, you know, there was stuff around. Um, and I, like, I remember coloring a lot um, in a coloring book with like under underwater life. <laughs> and uh, my parents were always making things um, just as part of the family's everyday existence. So my mom sewed my clothes when I was a little girl. My father did landscaping. He built things in our house, but they had other um, jobs as well. And so they were doing that perhaps in the beginning because of financial need, you know, it being at that time less expensive to do it oneself. But that's never really the message I got. The message I got was they were doing those kinds of things because they really liked it. They loved it. Right. Um, so I had like aunts who I remember crocheted hats and my grandmother knit. And, um, you know, I, I remember needle pointing and rug hooking, but I don't, I never was like, felt like, oh, I'm going to be an artist or, um, I don't even think I was like felt particularly encouraged in school. And it's not that my parents discouraged me, but it was just so much part of everyday life right. that um, it never occurred to me that I might sort of pursue that as anything else, but just kind of a fun thing to do. When did you start knitting? I'm not really sure how old I was. I'm sure I wrote somewhere like in the introduction to knitting in America, maybe I don't remember how old I was, but young. And I just remember my mother started teaching me how to knit and I'm left-handed and my mother is right-handed and she thought she had to do something differently. So I was not successful. And then she just brought me to my grandmother who taught me how to knit the way she knit, which is continental. And I see knitting as a two-handed thing. So there was no problem once right. My grandmother wasn't trying to like reverse what she was doing. And then my mother's sister, my aunt taught me how to purl. And I just remember these like long metal, super pointy needles that like hurt. And um, this, I remember this yellow yarn. I would imagine it was acrylic. I don't know. And, um, you know, just adding and dropping stitches all over the place. And uh I think I had a couple of starts and stops as a kid. I don't recall ever like finishing anything or even, I don't know if I ever thought I was making anything in particular. I liked it. And then I started knitting again in college when I was um, studying in France and um, a French friend and some Scandinavian friends were all knitting and, you know, they had like, you know, brown paper bags that they cut out to make like patterns with and um and so I decided to knit a sweater um I went out and got yarn and then I would learn my vocabulary um like every row I would say like a word in French and what it meant in English you know and then I would switch to the next row <laughs> and uh 
I think my mother finished it when I got home, but we didn't have enough yarn, so it became a vest. And uh, and then I really didn't knit again until um, I was 25 when I moved to New York City and I had a job with a little bit of income and I went into a yarn store on the Upper West Side and um, I was just blown away, you know, just how beautiful the yarn looked to me. And I, I think, you know, I was both at a point where I had some free time and also I had a little bit of money and so that's when I really became a knitter to me it's like knitting has this funny influence on my life because my my grandmother taught me to knit when I was probably like seven or eight something like this it was like one lazy summer when she didn't know what to do with me and so she showed it to me and I immediately got it it was somehow like easy for me but then like that was the only few weeks that I needed and then I haven't touched it until I was in my 40s. Oh, um, wow. But some of my most vivid memories of childhood is when my grandmother was teaching me how to mend socks mm -hmm. or how to sew buttons on. And I was probably like four or five when I was doing that. And she had that wooden mushroom that you would put into the heel of the sock. And then she was showing me how to mend it. So it's like really strong. And it's sort of things that nobody is even thinking about today. We're living in this world of fast fashion. And like you, if the button falls off, you just donate it to somebody else and you buy a new shirt. Oh my gosh. And, and I miss that. Like I... Yeah. I think like that's why those memories are like so important to me because that's my lifeline to to my grandmother, to that memory, to that connection that I had with her. And I feel like I probably came back to knitting with that in mind, like looking for that connection and looking for that sort of like continuation and meaning and and um, heritage sort of like. Do you feel the same when you need, do you feel like you are connecting with previous generations through that? Absolutely. I mean, in terms of, you know, connecting to people of in my family who were, were, have, are alive now or were alive when I was young, you know, I, I definitely remember like, you know, my grandmother would come to visit and then my mo mother would give her like shirts that needed the buttons replaced or pants that needed hemming. And, you know, that was, it, my mother could do those things herself, but, you know, it was a way for my grandmother to kind of contribute. And we would be like sitting around the table with this kind of thing happening. I remember my grandmother knitting, like she had this like old paper shopping bag next to a chair in her apartment. And it was just so like worn out and there was just like yarn. And then the pattern was, you know, paper and all sort of crumpled, you know, cause she had like folded it and taken it with her places and all. And I didn't know my paternal grandmother because she passed away when I was a few months old. But when I visited my father a few years before he passed away, um, he had this yellow vest that his mother had made for him and um, he was putting a button on it, a, like a brown leather button that had fallen off and then he wore it and it was in perfect condition and it still looked so good on him. And, you know, I had heard that she was a knitter, but I had never seen any of her knitting and I just, I said, now I have the vest and it just means so much to me and it it has so much like real value to me um if you looked at it in terms of dollars and cents you know like it, i don't think anybody would sort of pay a lot for that but it's beyond dollars and cents like it does make me feel connected to my heritage to my grandmother and whoever taught her to knit which probably was her mother her sister and then also you know to my dad who obviously cared so much about that best that he kept it for all those years and he kept it in such good condition so um yeah I mean I think in this day and age when we don't tend to live you know in the same village <laughs> with the with our sometimes our closest family or our extended family, um, you know, we still want to feel like rooted in some way. 
I spent some of the summers with my grandmother and I remember like eating cherries for her to make cherry preserves with the mm-hmm. European or like kneading dough. So she was make she was making swans out of dough with the raisins for eyes. And somehow like I don't remember much else, but like I do remember those those memories that like something somehow involved with the hands, like something that we were making with our hands, like those, the memories that stay with me. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the idea for this book? Tell me like your journey to decide to write this book. I think that it's kind of, it is the book that was brewing inside of me from the very beginning, but it took decades for me to have kind of the life experience to feel ready to do it because even when I um, first started knitting as an adult I was as interested in the product of knitting as I was in the process of knitting I was as interested in the yarn as I was in the heritage and and I was particularly interested in the lives of knitters um, and looking at um, history through knitting and which was you know once the knitting guilds ended and I guess that was most mostly if not all men and then knitting became more domestic it was really women's stories these stories that you know we don't hear a lot about or read a lot about in history books so I was really interested in learning about women by way of their handwork and in the beginning it was it was knitting and as my I was able to combine this personal interest with my profession which was as a writer and editor in um, the publishing world and then I was able to I wrote Knitting in America and I wrote Kids Knitting um, and Knitting in America was of course this journey uh, to many areas of this country meeting um, people, people who were knitting, people who were raising animals for fiber, who people who were dyeing yarn, and and learning about their lives, and then kids knitting was to teach kids how to knit or kids at heart, and um, and then I became the editor of Interweave Knits magazine, and in that job, I really was, I it was really important to me to bring a lifestyle style kind of angle to it, and I by that I don't mean only this sort of modern idea of like rather than having a model sort of standing in a studio kind of setting but having them in sort of a real life kind of setting but also how does knitting fit into our lives um, as opposed to a magazine that was more focused on you know these are the here's 20 beautiful projects to make and here's you know a special technique and certainly with interweave knits um, at that time we combined technique and um and projects, but also with how knitting fit into lives and culture. Um, And I, it was both the the kind of um, content we put in it, but also how we photographed it um, and uh, just presented it generally. And I was also interested in like where the yarn comes from and how the, the type of, in terms of natural fibers, it would be like the kind of animal that grew that fiber and how it was handled. And so it was definitely going kind of deeper than this is just the product, um, the project, you know, this beautiful item to make. And at that time, that was kind of unusual, which is interesting to me today, because now what I'm describing is, is very usual. (laughs) You know, it is, what I think um, a large amount of the population really wants. It seems like it's what you're, one of your goals in this podcast is to get to know real people, not just the product of their hands, but the sort of process. And and it's funny because like we also change as crafters because at the beginning, the idea might be just to, make something some projects right and if you think about historically it's it's also very interesting to look at crafters because like i remember my grandmother she was a seamstress she was like really great seamstress so she could make a dress in a couple hours 
But then she would spend a lot of time crocheting the little embellishments or like she made me a dress once and all the buttons were wrapped in the red fabric to like make that pop of color on otherwise gray dress. And I was thinking even back then, I remember thinking that like she didn't have to go extra step to just give me a dress, right? Like all those extra embellishments were the way to pour your love into the process like to, the process the love of the process more than the you know the final the idea for the survival that you just need to have something to put on yourself you know yeah and, and that has been happening since like the beginning of human history that um people have made the ordinary extraordinary in order to show like you know, this textile is worn on this occasion or this um, way of lighting the candles or this kind of song it enters into this occasion. You know, these are all like rituals and sacred things. And it's what I think it, it makes life meaningful. And it's interesting that like I was reading the story of Estonian lace. So yeah. they, they were selling it by the weight. And to make the weight heavier, they came up with noops, which is like this little embellishment that looks like a bead, but it's actually like a few times the yarn wrapped around to make this like stitch puffier. And that adds a lot of extra weight to the otherwise ethereal shawl. So I wonder I wonder why they were selling it by weight, though, because that's sort of, there's the word antithetical to like lace, you know, that whole idea that it's it's like, it's more air than it is anything you you it's like how where the air is in the shape of the air that kind of defines what the lace looks like right but with all that like that was the system at that time but they came up with the way not only to make it heavier but to make turn it into flowers to turn it mm -hmm. into leaves like to, to turn it into like almost like they look almost like pearls so it's mm -hmm. cheaper pearls you know alternative to pearls so it's always interesting for me to see how even when people do something to sell the product they look at the ways to differentiate it from other products around them like they would have their own motives so they would have their own signature buttons or something that's gonna make it unique and make it their own mm -hmm. and it's I think it's also so interesting to look at it based on you know, where it happened, like if in Estonia, they have certain kind of vegetation. So, you know, in terms of shapes that a lace knitter might see, mm -hmm. they would maybe come up with a motif based on that. Or maybe that if you look at the history of the country, there was certain cultures that, you know, maybe it was invaded, or maybe, you know, people from another country made their way into that country, and then they brought with them their own motifs and then that got melded together and so you can really like read lace with that in mind or you know, all sorts of color work and knitting as well which I find very interesting yeah and it's not only in lace it's also like in knitting techniques because like if you go to like Shetland Isles for example because there were so many ships coming from different countries they have different influences so you have one side of the aisle that needs this knitting belt and mm -hmm. another one that needs continental or needs English drawing, you know, so it's like it's a small territory, but they all using different techniques because of the different influences by people who stopped on their way from one place to another. And, yeah, exactly. And I find it interesting that like, when people talk about Western style knitting, right, English drawing or English picking, it's sort of what we use in the patterns so it's the standard in the us and uk but then there is the whole like eastern europe that knitting continent combination continental like so i would i was taught by my grandmother how to do combination continental and then when i came to the us like one of the first things that i've heard about my knitting that i'm doing it all wrong and i'm twisting all my stitches so it's sort of like I had to learn for myself how to defend my style of knitting. I had to understand the whole mounting of the stitches and like that what I'm doing is actually right because it's been done by thousands of women yeah. for, for generations, right? So it's 
it's interesting that like I find that I'm learning through my journey in knitting I'm learning so much more about the history of it and like right. you know. yeah yeah it's funny because I knit I was taught continental because my family came from eastern Europe so that's you know how my grandmother knit that's how everyone in my family knits and um I remember when I was in my 20s and I was knitting in public and some women saw that I knit continental and they were so excited because that's how they knitted and I think not as many people in this country knitted that way. So, um, but they said, oh, you knit the good way. I find it actually very interesting because since I started putting like little tutorials of how to do combination continental and explaining the stitch mounts and explaining how you do increases and decreases in, in combination continental, and a lot of people reached out to me. There were people from South America. There were people from Europe who were like, oh, this is how my grandmother taught me how to knit. So it's really not just uh, the Eastern Europe that... No. Mm -hmm. But like we've been... A lot of people just like shame you into specific technique. And to me, it's the beauty of it that you can learn, trace this history and see how your ancestors knitted and how it's different from the neighbors next door, you know? Yeah. And also if you understand stitch mount, you know, and you understand if like, you're twisting it on one row, but you're untwisting it on the other row. Like that is, is really important. And so many of us these days don't really learn to, well, maybe, maybe this is wrong. When I was sort of coming up as a knitter, it was not as common to like really learn how to read your knitting. You learned how to read the pattern. Right. And then you were like sort of like helpless. <laughs> You know, like, I remember when I found, I think it was an old, maybe it was a Mary Thomas book and it had a really clear picture of stitch mount and how to pick up a drop stitch. And I was like, oh. I mean, I had probably been knitting as an adult for like a year or two. And if I had a drop stitch, I just somehow found a way or gave it to somebody else to fix. And it's so easy to fix if you're just working in stockinette for sure. And, um, it was so empowering. And I remember I like purposely dropped like five or six stitches and which would have been a horror before I had seen, you know, that illustration that made it so clear. No, it's, I mean, with, with YouTube specifically, like it's becoming so easy to find information. I mean, granted, there is a lot of misinformation out there as well. So you have to be careful in your sourcing, but uh, there is so many wonderful uh, channels that show you like some techniques and how to fix your mistakes and how to understand your knitting so it makes it easier to learn today to be a more knowledgeable crafter today yeah yeah for sure well I want to get back to the book though okay um when you were collecting those stories, you were talking to all those different crafters and in that book it's not just knitters there are all different kinds of crafters there. Were you learning from this process for yourself something? In terms of handwork, was I learning? Not just I... handwork, but like, did it open your eyes to how other people see craft in their life, what it meant to them? Like, or Absolutely. I mean, I feel like throughout my life, I have had the privilege of meeting makers all over the world and, and, and learning from them and kind of um, figuring out who I who I am and who I want to be and what I want to learn and what kind of life I want to have. And I think the common theme of the people featured in making a life is that they are they have made a life for themselves that is in keeping with their values. And you know, they in general prioritize resourcefulness creativity, um, personal expression, um, creating something of beauty. Um, and many of them have figured out a way to combine, you know, what they make with their hands and how they make a living, but um, not all. And I think the, or I know that part of the point of the book is to say that using our hands to make things is part of our, um, you know, it's in our DNA. It's part of our 
biological inheritance and that um, it's part of being human. And we focus so much on making a living and in some people, for some people, you know, making a good life is becomes somewhat secondary, but if we can balance those things a little bit better, we can feel more at home in our own skin and more content in this world. And so I think that the people in the book have demonstrated that for me. And I feel like since writing the book, I have been able to sort of realign certain things in my life. And and I think that is the direction I have always been going. I mean, when I was in my 20s and working in publishing, and then I started to knit, and then I wanted to combine, you know, my interest in knitting and handwork and women's lives with my career in publishing. And so, and my career was always kind of informed by what I felt passionate about. And so being a writer and editor, I mean, it allowed me to travel to different countries and to meet makers because maybe I would write an article for Vogue Knitting about the Shetland Islands and about, um, or I went to the Orienburg region of Russia and wrote about the lace makers there. Um, and then, you know, more recently I've gone to India and ended up working with a yarn company there to help them develop their palettes. So like, it's just been this life that's been, um, a guiding force has been like, what am I passionate about? What am I curious about? And being able to be a writer and an editor and a creative director has kind of allowed that to happen. And, um, but it's just a constant process and, um, yeah, I just feel like the fact that I got to meet and spend time with all of these individuals in this book, um, was such a privilege and gift. I mean, a lot of crafters, there's this whole concept of struggling artists, right? Like it existed for hundreds of, if not longer years. Um, and especially now, like there is this tendency of looking at craft as something oh that's cute you know not not serious not not art like you do craft because you don't know what else to do like you, it's especially like if you step outside of the u.s where it's more fashionable like if you look in south america and they're like amazing crocheters out there they sell it for pennies like in turkey they sell it for nothing they in even orenburg like those shows you can buy for very little money and the truth is they are crafters on the highest level they probably like been doing it for years and years and they perfected that craft do you feel like this book will educate people about that that's the importance of craft and the appreciation of craft and understanding this, those skills? I certainly hope so. I mean, uh, my goal is for the book to change the world, you know, to, to help people to understand the value of what I refer to as handwork. I don't, I try to avoid the words craft and art because I feel like they're sort of difficult because we all, tend to define them differently, but I feel like um, whether we are valuing handwork um, as something that we do or as something that other people are doing and we, you know, purchase is important. And when you understand how something is made, when you understand where the materials come from, you develop an empathy for the whole process from sort of the environmental impact, the um, socioeconomic impact, um, and you develop kind of connections and appreciation. I sort of cringe when I hear like this idea of like craft being lesser because I feel like we're all creative and you could say we're all artists. You know, we've, society has kind of put these values onto things um, and as if one is better than the other. And I don't see, there's certainly work that in, that would be defined as, you know, art and craft. that's like beautifully made, like technically incredible. And then there's things that are not as technically incredible or that I don't relate to, 
but that seems kind of irrelevant to me. <laughs> um, I think our society is so much um, guided by this idea of like how much money can be paid for it or um, how much status you can gain from it. And, and that is often like very unfair. You know, why is it that crocheters in Turkey are saying, you know, are paid pennies for their work? You know, that's because the society has deemed that work of less value, but I don't see it as of less value. Mm -hmm. So I want to sort of shift all of that and say, like, let's learn how, let's re learn how to make things, um, whether we're doing that ourselves or we're observing it in others and appreciating it. And let's change our world so that there isn't this idea of like some one person's work is more valuable than somebody else's work um, for kind of arbitrary reasons or to me, arbitrary reasons. Right. I mean, to me, it's like, it's interesting that in today's society, the whole idea of success or your worth as a person is sort of tied to money and to your position. And you had a very successful career, but, did you feel successful or do you feel successful now that you spend more time learning about other people's uh, handiwork? I think I feel successful, more successful and happier as a human being right now because I'm able to spend more time actually using my own hands to make things. And I feel a sense of purpose in terms of sharing what I learn and what I, um, and my ideas about the value of, of creativity. So you, when the way you worded the question is, you know, do I feel successful because I've been able to write about other people? And yes, I mean, I, it's almost like I spent a large amount of my career kind of collecting mentors. <laughs> And in some cases, you know, when I was working um, as a publishing director for a book publisher and we were publishing all sorts of books on craft and creativity, you know, I was, I was the person who was acquiring the books and making somebody else, giving somebody else the opportunity to kind of express their creativity in a book form. But at the same time, you know, I tended to work with people who I really admired. So, you know, and at the same time, I felt like they were my mentor and they were uh, modeling a life in which handwork took priority. Um, I think now I have better balance than I had before. And that is partially just because I'm older. And, you know, as you, if you have, the good fortune of having, you know, an adequate career to sort of earn some money and have a home. And, you know, you have your basic needs of like home and nourishment and safety that, um, and then my son is 25. So you know, I have a little bit more free time. So now I'm really conscious of the choices I make about how I spend my time. And there's so many things in our culture right now that distract us and numb us and um but I try to be really conscious of those things and um make choices about how I spend my time so that makes me feel successful and happy <laughs> and I think sense. like one of the interesting points about this book that it's not necessarily to show people how to quit their job today and make financial success selling crafts or selling their handiwork. I'll yeah. use your terms for that. But it's more about how to find that balance and how to find that appreciation for something that you do with your hands, whether it's going to turn into financial success and give you that financial freedom. It's like, that's not what the book is about. It's basically about finding that balance for each individual person. Yeah, exactly. And um we do, it does run counter to so much that's happening around us, um, which, you know, I'm saying to people, like, look at your hands, you know, like, think about what you can do with your own hands. And what, you know, social media is saying is like, 
look at your phones, click here, go further away from yourself. Like the answer is, you know, get this credit card and then you'll get to go on this sailing vacation. This is advertisement is telling you like this credit card is going to allow you to do and you're going to get along great with your family. And like, it's all outside of you. And um, I feel like there's, wherever we go, we take ourselves. So the contentment has to come from inside ourselves. And so handwork can bring that into our lives in a way that um, may not turn into a career. And I meet a lot of people where it does become their career. And some of them are very content with that. And others feel like it turned into a business. And then the part of it that gave them great joy um, is no longer prevalent for them on a daily basis. So it's really, it's always about about that balance and I also find that um when you're content with like how you're spending your time you don't really need as much money <laughs> because you're not looking for you know like oh if I buy this dress or those shoes or um you know go to this restaurant you know all things that can cost money you know then I'm gonna feel okay that's just not where I find as much joy as I do, you know, right now I've been crocheting hexagons. You know? <laughs> well, I want to run and like, I want to tell you a funny story that recently happened to me. So I was visiting my parents in Miami and my husband uh, was invited with some to meet with some clients of his. So it was husband and wife, very wealthy the woman was just stunning she was dressed in designer clothes from head to toes and there i was wearing my sweater that i made and the whole night we were only talking about this sweater and she was trying to convince me to knit her sweater exactly like that <laughs> oh my gosh did you say i'll teach you how to knit <laughs> i sort of did but uh, i found it like very interesting because this was a woman who could buy anything she wanted and yet she was really interested in purchasing that sweater. Right. Yeah. But I also think it's interesting. And I mean, we're not all, we're all different. And, you know, although we all come from, there's making in all of our DNA because that was how life happened, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, you made everything you needed for survival. So it's in our DNA, that doesn't mean that we're all going to be makers today, although I think that would be a really good thing. Um, but that, that it wouldn't occur to her, like for her, from what you're saying, like, the, you see something you like, and then you should be able to buy it, you know, like, that's how you obtain things. And I often think, what people miss when they ask us like, well, how much would that cost? Or how much time did that take? It's like, I'm not knitting a sweater because I want a sweater. Like that's not my main goal. I want the process, you know, and everything that um, that process means to me. And I've recently, I've been thinking about, um, you know, the other question that people ask when they see you like, well, what are you making? And, I think, you know, you can say I'm making a sweater, but you could say like, I'm making love, I'm making connection, I'm making sense. You know, this is how I'm making my life make sense to me. Another comment that you, we as knitters hear all the time, like all the time is like, oh, I would never have patience to do that. And I'm often laughing at this because I consider myself very impatient person in, in like reg regular life. And yet when I need patience, I, I grab my knitting because that's what gives me patience. Yeah. Like you became also like more patient with that. Like do we, we become more mindful with every stitch. We sort of forget about all the worries of the world. And we forget that we have to like run, pay the bills and run, do the groceries and do this and do that. And yeah, I, mean, I definitely feel like um, my knitting, you know, breeds mindfulness. You know, I think a lot of times knitters will say like, oh, it's mindless knitting. And I, it always makes me sort of stop because, yes, there is knitting where you're not thinking at all and you're just um, 
you know, I don't know, maybe you're watching TV or something, but a lot of knitting is actually mindful. And it's bringing you to this place where you can sort of calm your nervous system and it's taking um, your focus away from like your to-do list and it's um, allowing kind of your, your systems <laughs> to calm. And it's through that that oftentimes like solutions come to us. I mean, that's the breeding ground of creativity. You know, you're like, I have to figure this out. I have to do this, 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 and this. It's a very stressful place. It's not a very creative place. But when you can ground yourself in the rhythm of knitting and, you know, oftentimes if it's not quiet all around you, it's quiet in your mind, you know, because you're focusing on one thing. And that is something that so many of us need more of in our lives. And I have talked to people who meditate. I've talked to, recently I talked to a Buddhist nun uh, about this, about, you know, what is meditation? What is mindfulness? And like, you know, is knitting or let's say hand building and pottery, like, is that meditation? And it really seems to depend on the intention that you bring to it, um, the role that it can play. But the idea of, um, slowing down, calming down, focusing, whether that's on the flame of a candle in meditation or the work in your hands is so beneficial to us. And it, for me, it's a way that I can reach kind of a mindful place or a meditative state that works better for me than sometimes than sort of sitting down and trying to do what we imagine as sort of traditional meditation where we just like completely quiet or eyes are closed or maybe we're staring ahead and we just try to like not think <laughs> which is <laughs> right which is I so think, hard i think you touched also on a very interesting point i have a friend he's uh dr srini pillay he's a psychiatrist and he wrote the book about oh, wait the tinker dabble doodle try right. oh my god you have to introduce me to him i just read it it would be my pleasure. We are really good friends. And he concentrates on the, he talks about the power of unconscious uh, mind and how like all the creativity is there. Like we need to have these moments of unconsciousness and uh, like not thinking, not analyzing, not constantly being on the go in order to free our creative juices basically and let our mind wander. I literally just took the book back to the library a couple of days ago. And I was like, oh, like I, I don't know, like, maybe I should keep the book. Maybe I should buy a copy. And I was on his website. And yeah, but I no, I really want to talk to him because he did make a comment about knitting in the book, but I didn't couldn't tell if he actually completely understood like the value of it. Um, so yeah, I really want to talk to him. Oh, he understands because we spent hours talking about knitting and the benefits of knitting. So he's actually, he was on my channel. He was, uh, if you guys want to take a look at it, there is an episode with Dr. Srini. I'm going to put it on in the description of this video as well. Oh my gosh, absolutely. We're, I'm going to watch it. We, and we were talking about the uh, creative people in general and how to deal with the uncertainty of today's world and how to deal with creators' burnout. And that's another thing I want to talk to you about. When you were working, and it's a very stressful job, I imagine, and there is a lot of things to juggle, like a lot of things that have deadline and you have to, and you're responsible to other people for editing the book and, and all of the things that go into what you were doing. Did you find that knitting was the saving grace that it like allowed you to forget about all that stress? So I think you're talking about my job at Abrams um, when I was working on the, the imprint with all the craft and creativity books, which was, um, yes, a very stressful job. Um, you know, I made time for knitting and hand sewing, I remember, and, and dabbling in other things during the 13 years that I worked there. Um less than you would imagine. <laughs> um, you know, I was always working on books um, in sort of the craft and creativity realm, 
But um, my son was quite young then. So, you know, I was working full time and, and working as a mom. You know, I always like to, people say, oh, they don't like being a mom. Like, I don't work. It's like, oh, yeah, you work. You're just not being paid. You know? <laughs> but um, so I didn't have as much time as I have today. And I was always trying, not always. I, I, you know, I've said before, it was like a plumber with leaky pipes. You know, I was so inspired by all the different people that I would meet and the types of books that we'd work on. And, um, you know, I went through a period where I did a lot of hand sewing when we were doing the, I was doing the books with Natalie Channon, the, of the School of Making in Alabama Channon. I was hand sewing a lot of um, clothing using cotton jersey. Um, and I did some knitting, but, um, you know, I, when I left that it was really about getting back to my true self and I it was a great job and I you know it's not like it was a bad job it was great but it for me it kind of ran its course and it was time for me you know you know a lot of times in life like you do one thing and then you kind of have to do the opposite thing like oh I or even like I remember we used to live like really high up on a hill and then we ended up like it was really hard in the snow so then we moved really low and then it was in a floodplain and like now I live in the middle you know <laughs> So, you know, in life, like I had this kind of like people looked at as like a fancy job and like I got to do all this cool stuff like that. It was very kind of in my head, cerebral. And um, and then I needed to get back to like the work in my hands. And like all I wanted to do was, you know, weed my garden and mow the lawn. Like I just wanted to be responsible for my own life right. and I at that time like I could afford to pay someone to mow my lawn or weed my garden but I didn't want to I wanted to do it myself and you know success does seem to be like when you can pay somebody else to do everything but that just feels for me personally like a kind of failure so that was the problem with the job of you know not having the right balance so tell me about like your life today well, i'm working on a new book and it's definitely a big challenge and it's a follow-up to making a life and it's about a lot of these ideas and that's been hard because it it feels like in a way not that i'm that old but it does feel like a culmination of all these ideas and i've written so much about other people and i published other people's books and i've done a few of my own and but in the ones that i've done of my own i've either you know highlighted other people's work told other people's stories so the new book is more my experiences as a maker um and what that has taught me and how I feel like I want to share that with the world so I do try to work on that every day but I was reading your friend's book and trying to remind myself like just forcing myself to sit down at the computer to write is like it feels like I, I need to do that but it's um not that effective all the time. So I do have a lot. I tend to do a lot of handwork things. I am doing now the 100 day challenge. So mine is to make a crocheted hexagon every day so that I can stitch them together to make a blanket. And um, I actually make more than one a day usually, but like I have some yarn right here that I was <laughs> like, so I do tend to like get up and you know, eat breakfast, get dressed, all of that kind of stuff, and then kind of figure out how I can achieve what I want during the day. And I do try to balance the work with um, kind of creative activities that help me to feel good about my life and, and in fact, sort of feed my creativity. Um, we're coming up on gardening season, so I'm thinking about my garden. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out like a more specific way when you say like, what's a typical day? Cause I work at home. I work for myself. I do, I am the editor and creative director of the modern daily knitting field guide. So there's very often work to do on that. I'm about to take on another job with a writer to help her with a book I I think she wants to self-publish um and um 
you know, I'm trying to write my own book, which is the hardest one I've ever tried to do. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, like the book that I'm working on now is sort of using my own experiences as a maker as a jumping off point for writing about these ideas. So right now, like throughout the last couple of years, I've been sewing a lot of my own clothes and I've been learning how to draft really, really simple patterns so that, and I've even previously I had hand sewn a lot of clothes using cotton Jersey, which is one technique, but I actually learned, I drafted a pattern with a linen dress. And so did much and, I do them all with like French seams and everything and, you know, figuring, learning how to um, make it so it fits me just right. So even something that's really just a shift dress, like goes in at the right point on my waist so that it's really flattering. And um, so like, I find that the more I can do for myself, whether that's making my own clothes or making my own meals or growing my own food, um, we eat on pottery that plates that I made because I've stopped now because I don't have time to be at the pottery studio now but like I learned how to make dishes and stuff so I just find that the more I'm able to incorporate that into my daily life the better I feel so it's just always this balance of like what I do to earn the money that I need to earn to feel safe and secure and also feeling like my life has purpose. And as I said, like, I really feel like I want to share with people this idea that handwork has a role or creativity has a role in all of our lives to, to help us to feel content and happy and to be empathetic and to be at peace and to be, when we're at peace, we can be at peace with other people and then we can like reverberate out and make the world more peaceful. And if we can share that, that idea, that concept with people around us and share our skills and our enthusiasm and they can become makers too, that, you know, we can make a better world. So. I and a more beautiful world. Yes. <laughs> more peaceful and beautiful world. And um, so I think I'm, I'm sort of going around in circles here, but you know, the idea of like what I, of living and keeping with my values, which is, you know, as I said, the people I wrote about in making life, you know, it was like mentors to me and spent so much of my life, like curious and exploring and like wanting to understand myself, but doing like, traveling and talking to people or you know and getting to know people and sort of figuring out what feels right to me and it's I'll just say this one thing like I my family came from eastern europe my grandparents on one side and my great grandparents on the other side so we've been here for a few generations but you know this our country is made up a lot of a lot of people from elsewhere. And so we talk about, you know, like, oh, like, where's your family from? But when I visit countries like in, in India or in Mexico, where I meet people where you say, like, where's your family from? Like, they're literally from that land, their roots go down so deep. And that is so fascinating to me. That idea that, I mean, like, whereas I feel like maybe it's an American thing or maybe it was my family or maybe it was me personally of like sort of shopping around for figuring out like who I would be or I wanted to be. And then, you know, there's other people, I'm sure in this country and, and certainly in countries where there's these deep roots that they feel like there's stability there. But for me, the stability has come differently. Right. That makes sense. I think I think it like it's it very much makes sense to me because I traveled all my life from place to place and I you know this is not my original country so for me like that it's it's often comes through like cooking or like un sources that you wouldn't even think about but that connects your previous life in different country to your new life here right it's mm -hmm. me learning dishes from different places that make me feel at home here somehow so it's like it's it's a strange feeling that you trying to find the place for yourself and you're trying to understand who you are in yeah 
in this place and age, but it's also sort of always this connection to the past and to people from those. Yeah. Places. And you know what? It just occurred to me, like I didn't use this word, but when you talked about, when well, you asked me about my day and a lot of the things I talked about doing or preparing to do are domestic. There's a lot of domesticity there. And, um, you know, I think for women in this country, it's, you know, we're on, there's just this path of like having previously, not just in this country, but throughout the world, women not having a lot of choices, not having rights, and then getting that and having more choices. And there was a period like, I remember my mother was like a charter subscriber to Ms. Magazine. And, you know, I remember that when I was a little girl and it was like so important and you were sort of told to like go out in the world and, you know, work in an office and have a career and make a lot of money because you can. And, um, and, and if, and that was, there's nothing wrong with those things, you know, but again, it's that balance. Like for me, I, it's not that I wish that I had sort of stayed home my whole life because that's not how I feel at all. But I also think like, there's so much value to like what our grandmothers gave us and what we were talking about in the beginning of this conversation that is been undervalued in our culture. Like the message, Oh, I think, you know, it's not your grandmother's knitting. And it's like, it's absolutely my grandmother's knitting. Um, I, I, I think it's also, it's like, it's very important and it's, it's a source of peacefulness. It's a source of, um, as you said, it's meditation in this way, you know, and it's like in using your hands, you find the peace in your soul. Yes. Well, I'm going to put the link to the to your book and some information about you in the description of this video. And if people want to find you, they can follow that the link and buy the book. And I want to thank you for being my guest today. It was wonderful having this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. We'll have to find a way to get together and knit. We'll do that for sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. You're welcome.